Tennessee Life is sponsored by Next to New, an upscale consignment shop serving Knoxville. Next to New Knox.com. And by The Flower Pot for over 100 years, offering flowers and same day delivery with two convenient Knoxville locations knoxvilleflowerpot.com and by viewers like you thank you coming up on tennessee life from small town roots to television shows and stages all over the nation leanne morgan is making people laugh to her real life is where you get the best comedy and i can just say god had his hand on me and put these people in my path i mean because i was a mom you know, in the in a school parking lot half the time with a bunch of babies in the back of a car. Buckle up for an animal safari where the wildlife likes to give you an up-close view. We go on a tour of Circle G Ranch where it all started with one man and his camel. We want people to have a place to go that they can hang out with the family and enjoy something interesting in a different way and, and not have to spend a, a, a lot of money to do it. Lather up for a Tennessee Green Clean. Natural oils and herbs make up the soap recipes at Rainwater Farm. Those stories coming up on Tennessee Life. Thanks for joining us for Tennessee Life. I'm Vicki Lawson. When it comes to making people laugh, Leanne Morgan thinks there's nothing funnier than her own real life stories about marriage and motherhood. When she made people row with laughter at casual get-togethers, she figured she could make comedy a serious career focus, and she was right. Leanne has told her personal tales on stages around the country, comedy festivals, and on national television. Stories like taking a pregnancy test at a Tennessee Walmart bathroom to find out she was having child number three. Between her busy performance schedule and radio programs, we caught up with Leanne Morgan when she was back home in Tennessee. And before I knew it, she was tickling my funny bone. Leanne, thanks so much for coming in today and sharing your story from small town Tennessee girl to comedian on stage. Thank you, and thank you for having me, you angel. Oh, you're more than welcome. I want you to tell us a little bit about growing up in Tennessee. Well, I was um, born and raised in Middle Tennessee um, in a farm community called Adams. It's 500 people on the Kentucky-Tennessee border. Were you a funny little girl, and did you come from a funny, you know, comedic-type family? If this had been my living room, I would have been up on that, maybe put a slip on my head to try to look like Cher and do a Sonny and Cher routine. I mean, I was that kind of ham kid. And my sister, I have one sister, she's older, and she's very quiet and very reserved and was more like a, a grown woman when she was little. And she was more like my mom, and my mom has been more like my partner in crime. And my mama loves comedy and Hollywood and raised me on Saturday Night Live, which was terrible because it was filthy. And my, and my dad would get so mad. But my, and, and let me say, my dad's a storyteller, very funny. Um, everybody loves to be around him, but my mom is more of the dazzler, and she loved Carol Burnett and all of those kind of all sitcoms and raised me on those. And we would we would sit and watch them together. And but she, if she went to a Tupperware party, she was like had the stage, and everybody thought she was hilarious. Her name is Lucille, and she's still very funny. So fast forward to married life and moving around quite a bit, and then motherhood took priority. What did you do to supplement your family income at that time? My husband was in the mobile home industry in Bean Station, Tennessee. Um, he sold used mobile homes and moved me up there. And I know I'm from farming, but I'm not from that rural of an area. And so when he had his own business, he was 27 years old, I was 26. I'd had my first baby and um, I wanted to stay home with him. And so I started selling jewelry like Tupperware, you know, in people's houses. And that's how um, I, we needed money. And so I found out that I was funny doing that. And then I don't, it was just a, a weird bunch of things that happened that people started realizing how funny, I, that they thought I was funny. And I started asking me to speak at big things for the jewelry company and then in my community in Morristown, Tennessee. It was then that people started saying, you know, would you like to go and do 20 minutes for the lawyers and, that do land and title work at the Grove Park Inn? And so I would go 
and do that and started making a little bit of money. I didn't know how, how much to charge or anything and my husband would keep the kids. And so um, I've been able to, to do comedy and you know make a living, even though I don't have to, my husband has taken care of me. I've been able to do a lot of wonderful things and skip a lot of yucky things in comedy because I've got him tending to me and I didn't have to make the living. Did you develop your own act or did you take it mostly from your experiences with your, your babies as yeah, you call I'm, them? I'm more of a storyteller and I, I don't, I'm not an observational, like Jerry Seinfeld look at a cotton ball and write a joke about it. I came up telling stories about my kids playing t-ball and what happened on the t-ball field or how I've tried to find a pair of jeans that fit me that is not going to show my backside. I, I tell stories about things that have happened in my life. And so my, my comedy is more like a Bill Cosby in that, you know, I just tell stories. And I love watching human behavior. And so to me, my comedy comes from human behavior in my household. Tell me something about those stories. What do you think are your favorite subjects or the subjects that have gotten you the most material or the most laugh? As my husband. My husband is an odd bird and he would say I was odd and I know I am. But my husband and I probably are not really the most compatible people on this earth. <laughs> he stalked me. I'll just tell you, Vicki, he stalked me when we were at UT because he was in love with me and I was a looker and before I lost my bloom and I, he was crazy about me and was getting an MBA and is brilliant and is like very math oriented and, all, and very analytical and very detailed person and who better to marry than a wild nut job like me who does not take any detail who you know rides the roads with a bunch of kids in the back and dirty diapers I mean it couldn't have been more ill-fated but because of that and we've had a wonderful marriage but because of that our differences have given me a lot of material. Would you share, if uh, just out of the blue, share a couple of the stories, something about your husband, something about your babies that you use in your comedy routine? The one story people always want me to tell is my baby, Moe, when we were in Marstown, we put him in T-ball. We didn't ask him if he wanted to go to T-ball. We just put him in it because everybody feels pressure to get your baby to learn how to play a sport. So anyway, we put him in T-ball. And there was one day, it was so hot, and I remember, I remember how hot it was, and I had the, ba the girls with me, and Lord, they were babies, and um, he was out in a fetal position, you know, on the glove, and he looked up and he went, water, water. So I had to take a water bottle out there. Well, I sent it by Maggie, who was two and a half at the time, and the middle child. She went running out to the field with this water bottle, and she stopped and got this glaze look over her eyes pulled her little panties to the side and pooped in the T-ball field. <laughs> Where was their daddy? Out selling a trailer somewhere. And then my baby child was 13 months old and was rummaging through a woman's purse in the bleachers. I'm not kidding, I was going, get out of her purse, Tess. So then I had to run out on that field and get a stick and flick that doo-doo out <laughs> into the woods so another child wouldn't step on it and think it was a milk dud. So. <laughs> Charlie would not play sports for several years because of that trauma. Until I think when we had moved to San Antonio, my husband thought, we'll put him in Pop Warner football. That'll be fun at 152 degrees in South Texas. So then that's when the next time he played sports. Cause I mean, he was traumatized by it, it was awful. And he never played baseball again. So often you find comedians that use humor by using vulgar language. And you have never done that. I got started in comedy professionally when my baby child was a year old. So I had three children and I had them, I had gotten back into church and was raising my family. And as a mother, I mean, I just could not imagine saying something that I didn't want my children to ever say. And I didn't want to be a bad example for them. And I didn't want to be a bad example for other people's children. And it, and it just guided me that, that and how I wrote and how I thought. And it's not that I'm prudish. I had somebody a long time ago that's been very successful in this business and he said, Lynn, if you're clean, you can do anything. You can do churches, you can do comedy clubs, you can do corporate things, you can make more money. If you're dirty, you can't clean dirty up. 
You can dirty clean up if you had to, but you can't do the opposite. And it made a lot of sense to me. I didn't want to be known as that because they, when you are um, a dirty comic or X-rated or R-rated, um, all you can do is comedy clubs, really. I mean, you can go on to HBO and, and venues like that, but I just, that just never appealed to me. I, I didn't want to go that route. Uh, you've always kept your Southern roots. You've always kept that in your routine. Is Tennessee where you want to keep home, your home base, no matter where comedy might take you? I love East Tennessee. I always used to think I want to move back to Nashville and Middle Tennessee, but I don't now. I mean, I love it in Nashville. It's nifty and all that, but I love the mountains, and I love where I've raised my children, and it's so much um, sweeter here. I would, I'd much rather live here. I don't think I ever want to live anywhere else. You can... Uh poke humor so much at yourself and talk about as you have aged and you have gone through the process and talk things that can hair your weight and all those things and you can make fun of them. Um, I think that makes you so genuine and you have been truly, you're, you're as friendly and as genuine as you are on uh, when you do your performances and I think that's remarkable. I think I've had so much uh, opportunity in television, that kind of thing, because I am different, because I am unique, because I am Southern, I'm, I am country, and I'm not ashamed of it, and I'm, they, keep, they tell me in LA, you're organic, you're, um, you're real, you know, but I am, I'm authentic, I don't put on any airs, I'm too tired. You know, when you've got a bunch of children, I mean, I can't fake this accent, you know. Well, Leanne, thanks for tickling our funny bones today and for sharing your funny Tennessee life. Thanks so much. Thank you. <laughs> Next on Tennessee Life, go on a wild animal safari. At Circle G Ranch, the animals roam free, and they're happy to let you and your feed bucket into their world. Cucumber, mint, and grits are in some of the recipes, but you don't eat this Tennessee product. The story behind the soap bars at Rainwater Farm, later on Tennessee Life. If you want to go on a wildlife safari adventure and see animals from around the world, you can do that right here in Tennessee. Circle G Ranch in Strawberry Plains is home to more than 500 animals, from camels and zebras to wallabies and pot belly pigs. And with several babies, the population is always growing. Think of it as a drive through zoo where you can get an up-close look and feed them right from your vehicle. Circle G founder Matt Michael always had a passion for animals, especially camels. And the first one he bought more than 20 years ago still roams the ranch today. I've got a chance to work at an animal park when I was younger and uh, got experience with the camels and really fell in love with them and it was a neat opportunity. I got to work for these guys out of Missouri with some camels and fell in love with it. Got to spend all day with kids and camels doing camel rides and, and decided that was for me and I, I was able to find my own camel and buy it and purchase him and uh, took, uh, took that and ran with it really. I mean I've been avoid, trying to avoid a real job ever since. Me and Abdul got a lot of miles together. Yeah, he's getting a little long in the tooth, you can see there. He's a 90, 91 model, so he's uh, 23 now. Circle G Ranch was established about uh, 95 or 4, something like that, officially. But I've always called what I was doing the Circle G Ranch just because I picked up the nickname Gumby when I was a kid. I had a pair of green overalls when I started working at that animal park. and. Uh, that's, uh, you know, the new guy got the nickname. We've got a lot of different species, probably 30 or more right now. We've, we're always adding stuff. Uh, we've got anywhere from, from A to Z. We've got an African Awdad and uh, all the way to zebra. So we've got water buffalo in between. We've got three different types of deer. We've got uh, fallow deer, psycho deer, red stag, which is red deer from Europe. We've got Indian antelope. Black buck antelope, we've got uh, emu, ostrich, rhea, 
uh, zebu cattle, uh, highlander cattle. We've got camels from both both species of camels. We've got baby camels. We're having uh, we've had a really good run of baby camels this year. We've had six camels born in the last six weeks. We're really proud of that. Any rabbits and goats and sheep and just a little bit of everything. We're kind of like the a zoo and a county fair and an amusement park kind of all rolled into one. <laughs> It's uh, taking the best things from everything we think. We, you know, we take a lot of time to figure out what's a good species, what, you know, between the behaviors and this kind of thing. You know, we don't want something that's gonna be overbearing and pushy and, and jumping on cars or something like that, you know. So you gotta be careful what you put where and who you put. But the good thing about having 100 acres, you know, as far as the animals themselves getting along with the other animals, they've got enough room. It's like kids on a playground. If they don't like somebody, they don't have to stand by them, you know. The cars definitely don't spook them, and they know that you're carrying, you know, feed with you. They uh, they look at you like you're their waiter. You know, you're handing it to them. You know, they're they're just lining up for the for the treats. <laughs> the animals are outsmarting the customers at this point. I think the uh, sometimes you see a little of that. They have learned to block the, they'll take turns blocking the car and the other ones will fleece them. It's, it's, it's interesting. They know those cars are full of food uh, and they, they take advantage of it. They know what you're here for and they want to give you a good time. So they're, they're, that's the welcoming party, I guess you want to say. <laughs> when we're standing at the camel ride on top of the hill, you know, you can hear them laughing the whole way through. You know, some screams are from the way in the back. You know, you're like, oh God, can't wait till they get up here. <laughs> They'll have a story for sure. You know, this is the what's going to be talked about for years, you know, in this car. They're going to be remembering that, you know. Everybody says they don't like the emu when they leave the window open and one sneaks in there and it freaks them out, but, you know, they're talking about it for a long time. Like the llamas as well, you know. They, they are nervous, but it's part of it. You know, it's part of the entertainment. You know, part of the uh, thrill. You know, you're in a wild animal park, you know. It's, it's the real deal. It's not scripted. Animals are smarter than the humans sometimes, and it's kind of fun to watch that all work and see the wheels turning in people's head. Well, what do I do now, you know? And while the rest of the crew's laughing at the driver, and the next thing you know, there's an emu sticking in the window, and you know, everybody's laughing. It's, it's all good time, and it's fulfilling, too. You know, you get to watch people uh, kids of all ages having fun, a family having a good time together in the vehicle. I mean, some, they might, you know, it's hard to find something that'll interest uh, the two-year-old and the 82-year-old, you know, and, and, and it's, uh, it, they, they bond over it too. It's a lot of fun. You know, they, people come back and tell you about how much fun the whole family had. It's as natural as you're going to get for them. You know, we're not on concrete. We're not behind bars. We're, we're you know, they are doing what they would be doing in that. You know, these Audad and the deer, they, they love roaming around, climbing on all these rock faces. We've got some cliff sides over here that they they dance around and play on. This terrain is is exactly what they're native to. It, it's, uh, it, I mean, you you look in the textbook or the encyclopedia, and you're going to see. Uh, very similar to this, and, and as far as like releasing them into the wild, you know, like the the black buck antelope as a whole, as as breeders of exotics in the United States, we've we've actually brought antelope back to India and released them into the wild. They uh, we've done a really good job of breeding the black buck in this country, and and they have trouble with tigers and poaching over there. And we've actually exported black buck back over there and released them back into the wild, which is really cool to be able to say that and be part of it. We like exhibiting things just a little bit different. It makes it more interesting and having people actually having it almost stay. They're having an experience they can't get anywhere else here. And that's, that's, that's what we want to give to people. The way we exhibit things, roaming around, being healthy, being happy, and you get to come in and be part of that. Your, your money is going directly back into that. I mean, you can see it. I think it's important for folks to be able to have that option to, and get to come out and actually be with the animals and smell them and hear them and, and watch them. It, it's, it's good for your soul.
Soap is usually just one of those things we pick up along with our groceries without giving it much thought. But a gift of handmade soap changed the way a Maryville, Tennessee woman thought about getting clean. After Colette Souder tried a handmade soap bar versus her typical store-bought one, she says she was hooked on the natural clean. So much so, she started making her own soap and launched Rainwater Farm to sell her bars online and at craft fairs. That was more than two decades ago, and today she's always working on her next soap recipe. My motto is, if we take care of ourselves, the environment will take care of itself. The reason we moved to East Tennessee is my husband always had a desire to be an organic gardener. And so we moved here and he has an acre garden in the back and has always grown our vegetables organically. So we have always been green that way, but I did not realize that the products we used on our skin were as important as what we put in our body. This soap business has been a gift to me and it's not fair just to keep it to myself. I want to spread the good news. My name is Colette Souter. I am the owner of Rainwater Farm, a soap making business that has been around for now 24 years. And we make handmade soap, liquid soap, balms, healing salve, lip balms, laundry soap, and a host of other products. The name Rainwater Farm came because I used rainwater in the soap. You want to use a soft water and rainwater is the best water to use. It just struck me as something natural and good. And I still have rain barrels outside collecting my water for my soap. About 25 years ago, we had some guests come to our house. They were, it was a family, and as a parting gift, she left three bars of her homemade soap. And it was strange, I thought, it was rose petal, but because we were a thrifty family, I wasn't gonna throw it away. So I put one bar in the shower my husband used, I put one bar in my shower, and we ended up fighting over the third bar. But it took me one use of that soap to make me realize I'm never going back to Dial, which is what I always used. The difference when I used this soap was that my skin did not get dried out. I did not feel like I had a film on my skin. My skin felt replenished and rejuvenated versus depleted. And it has gotten to the point where when I travel, I always bring my own soap everywhere. It's a very green soap that is good for people primarily and then it's good for the environment. I started researching soap making and back then there was not anything on it almost. Now you find it, you, there's lots of books, but back then there was nothing. But I read everything I could find and I kept calling this woman, asking her questions. And I didn't realize she, how vague she was being, but I just kept asking questions and for a year I studied it. Finally, one day when I called her, she just blurted out with this, okay, my husband said I could give you the recipe. And I was shocked and I thought, oh, I didn't realize she was holding back on me. But she did give me the recipe because soap makers traditionally um, keep everything secret. This has been from 500 years ago. And she was just keeping that tradition up because nobody wants to give up their recipe. Within six months of making my first batch, I had my first sale and it started off that way and it's probably grown, well, I'm really not sure how much it's grown, except I make probably now 15,000 bars a year, plus all my other products. I have over 90 labels that I have to make sure I have product for these labels and it's just grown. My first venture into making my own recipes, branching off from this basic recipe that I was given, was making my camper soap. And I called it camper soap because it, when you go camping, you need to repel mosquitoes and ticks and black flies or whatever you're dealing with. In that soap is lemongrass, eucalyptus, and geranium oils. And the combination works wonderfully to repel mosquitoes. I have a soap cucumber and grits. 
and it it exfoliates with Southern Comfort is how I say it. And Mass General Store sells so much of this because of the name. People come through and they want a Tennessee product and here it is made in Maryville and it has that great Southern flavor to it. I've grown a lot <laughs> since I started. I remember the first year when I was doing my taxes, I think I sold $25 worth of soap um, the first year and I am up to probably $100,000 a year. It's a small business and I am not going to be a Fortune 500 business very soon, but it doesn't matter. I do love what I'm doing and it's certainly worth it. We wish you could smell the wonderful scents through the TV screen, but you'll just have to sniff for yourself. You can find Rainwater Farm products at Mass General Store in Knoxville, as well as the Village Tinker in Maryville. You'll also find them at local arts and craft fairs. Colette also offers soap making classes where you can make and take home your own bars. We hope you've had fun exploring old fashioned soap making, along with the wildlife adventure tour at Circle G Ranch. And we hope you got to laugh along with Leanne Morgan. Just some of the things that make up our great Tennessee life. I'm Vicki Lawson. See you next time. Tennessee Life is sponsored by Next to New, an upscale consignment shop serving Knoxville. Next to New Knox.com and by The Flower Pot for over 100 years, offering flowers and same-day delivery with two convenient Knoxville locations, knoxvilleflowerpot.com.